the Russian invasion of Ukraine is unleashing a new era of military spending across Europe. Member countries of the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, like Germany, are now increasing their defense budgets. National polls right now are showing pretty big majorities in favor of armed exports to Ukraine and in favor of the announced defense funding. The U.S. remains the top spender in NATO with a defense budget that accounts for about 3.5% of U.S. GDP. The median amount spent by the 30 NATO member countries was at 1.6% of GDP in 2021. That number could be changing. Whenever there's a military crisis uh, involving Europe, uh, you're going to see military spending increase. I mean, we were arguing three or so weeks ago about whether the Nord Stream 2 pipeline would be canceled. And that sort of seems like ancient history at this point. Now NATO countries face the prospect of upgrading old weapons, developing and fielding new weapons, and replacing weapons given to Ukraine. In the U.S., the top military spender in the NATO alliance by far is looking at increasing its own budget while selling high-tech arms to friendly nations. In its 2022 fiscal year, the U.S. set aside $770 billion for defense spending. Now the Biden administration is requesting $813 billion for fiscal year 2023. NATO spending has been trending upwards since 2014, but the changing world order could supercharge defense budgets. Defense spending in Europe began to decline after the end of the Cold War in the early 90s. In 1991, NATO member states spent an average of $300 billion annually. By 1997, the average military spending across NATO fell to $250 billion. Think tanks began calling this the peace dividend. Countries had more room in their budget for non-defense items. NATO countries began to invest money in education, infrastructure, and healthcare instead of spending it on defense. The NATO alliance was created to counter the Soviet Union and Warsaw Pact, a collection of Soviet satellite states such as East Germany. Decades later, after the fall of the Soviet Union, the Russian Federation rose from the ashes, inheriting the USSR's nuclear weapons and large conventional military. Throughout the 1990s, Russia descended into economic distress and the military was generally underfunded and neglected. After Vladimir Putin rose to power in 2000, Russia attempted to modernize its Cold War era military. Without the former Soviet Union as a common rival, Western politicians began to question the effectiveness of NATO during the latter part of the 2000s. In the late 2000s, Russia began to involve itself militarily against neighboring countries, while also undertaking a modernization program for its armed forces. There's long been bipartisan frustration with uh, Europe on defense spending, and I think that's why in 2014, uh, it was the Obama administration that pushed for the the 2% pledge. The so-called 2% pledge came during a NATO summit in 2014. NATO countries said they would commit to spending 2% or more of their GDP on their militaries. It became an easy way for the Obama administration to rally for more military spending across Europe as it shifted focus to Asia. President Trump took his own stance on NATO and railed against the alliance during his administration for not meeting defense spending goals. NATO aims for a 20% share of defense expenditure to be on equipment. Since Russia annexed Crimea, spending has trended higher. For example, since 2014, Bulgaria has increased equipment as a percent of spending by more than 20 percentage points. Poland's increased by 6 percentage points, and Italy's spending on military equipment as a share of its total defense spending jumped from just more than 10% to 28.9%. The crisis has also demonstrated, is demonstrating, again, Europe's almost total dependence on U.S. deterrence capabilities, U.S. intelligence, U.S. political leadership, and that's a dependence that grows potentially more problematic as the U.S. elections draw nearer, right? And I think that policymakers in Berlin, but also in lots of other European capitals, should be really worried thinking about what the European response would have been would have looked like had there been a different president in, in the White House. Others have argued that having European nations beholden to U.S. security assistance actually helps Washington in other policy arenas. We have long opposed the European Union being involved in defense, and largely for sort of bizarre bureaucratic reasons. We just don't really want it to sort of get in NATO's way. But I think we need to sort of understand that the EU is a growing political actor when we see it uh, respond on sanctions. Uh, using its economic power, the collective economic power of Europe, is a, a, a you know, tremendous uh, amount of 
influence there. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has changed the conversation on defense spending across European capitals in a big way. German Chancellor Schultz has established a 100 billion euro defense fund and committed Germany to moving to the 2% of GDP standard for defense spending. This was unthinkable a month ago. Um, and so I think there really has been a significant move in other countries as well. Poland has said that it's going to go from two and a half percent to three percent of GDP. So, you know, the basics of international politics, when the world starts to look more dangerous, you would assume that countries get more serious about defense spending. And by and large, that's what we've seen from Europe so far. If defense spending rises in Europe, it could benefit a wide array of defense contractors. The U.S. has a large volume of companies that do business with European militaries, but there is competition in Europe. It has long been a challenge for European governments to decide what they prefer. Do they want to fill capability gaps fast through off-the-shelf purchases from the U.S., but at the cost of developing the European defense industry, or do they want to invest as much as possible in European capability projects, joint projects, partners, to strengthen the European defense industrial base? But you know that often comes with delays, um, long development times, higher costs. The U.S. is a major supplier of big, expensive, complicated military products like fighter jets and missile defense systems. But some NATO countries have their own homegrown defense industries. Take France, for example. It's home to Dassault, Thales, Airbus, and Nexter. The situation in Ukraine could spur the European defense industry to expand and increase cooperation on big projects like the Airbus A400M or the Eurofighter, which were created with funding from several different countries. I think what we really need to do in the months and years to come is a very honest analysis of what are the critical capabilities that we want to keep in Europe, that we want to keep nationally, and what are the capability gaps that we are going to need to fill very urgently. And then rather than making these decisions based on some sort of ideology, make them based on you know long-term planning on what types of industrial capabilities we want to preserve where. We like having the defense industrial base for economic reasons. Um, the same reason that they like having it for economic reasons. And I think that it is a trade-off, right? It's if you're going to have a more autonomous European defense capability, they're going to demand and in some sense need an indigenous defense industrial base on which they can draw, both for political purposes and for strategic purposes. Germany has signed a deal to buy F-35 Lightning II fighters, and several NATO-aligned countries are looking to upgrade from Soviet-era equipment like MiG-29s and Russian-produced surface-air missile systems to U.S.-made armaments. What we have seen is that NATO has clearly taken a, a leadership role in this crisis, right? In a way, this is what the alliance would, was made for. How the U.S. response in the coming months could shape how the European response to the war in Ukraine plays out. It's the crucial moment for the United States to take all of its longstanding complaints about European fecklessness and inattention to security and to allow them to build up a capacity that could allow the United States to create some distance between itself and European security safely without risk to American interests in Europe. Europeans look at this uh, crisis and uh, we'll be really concerned if Donald Trump was in office, someone who's a NATO skeptic. And so I think there's a sense in Europe that they need to uh, be able to take care of themselves if America is unreliable.